earlier you mentioned you're one of those people that easily puts on weight and it sounds like you're carnivore or you're at least highly swayed toward that end of the spectrum. Are you at this point 100% carnivore? I'm very close to 100% carnivore. Maybe once a week, I'll have some veg. Uh, once a year, we've got uh, blueberry bushes on the farm here. We've got an apple tree. We've got a pear tree, plum tree that, that Misha's grandfather planted years ago. And when those are ripe, me and Beckett, will go out. He's my three-year-old. We'll go out and we'll eat those every morning until they're gone. And that's usually a week or two, right? And so for uh, 51 50 or 51 weeks out of the year, I don't eat any veg whatsoever. Maybe once a week I'll have, you know, a Brussels sprout off somebody else's plate. But 99% of my what I ingest is animal foods. And that includes all the fat. That includes all the protein. And then there, there are a few carbohydrates in plant foods. But it's very, very tiny compared to any plant food. And as somebody who is on a really strict diet, carnivore-ish, how do you feel when you when you start including the fruit for that narrow period of time during the year? Do you feel like a big difference? I'm assuming you'd feel a big difference mentally, physically. I feel I feel the difference in my waistline, and so when the when the fruit is ripe, I'll put on two or three pounds in that in that two weeks just from eating the fructose and the excess sugar, because the the pears are delicious, the blueberries are delicious. So we also have blackberries as well. Uh, but that stuff's delicious. And, and I think that that's exactly why human beings enjoy that stuff so much is because we used to use that as a tool. When the fruit is ripe, that basically means winter's coming. And many people think, oh, yeah, but not not in the tropics, not around the equator. Yeah, if you talk to somebody who actually lives in these places, th- that fruit is seasonal as well. And so we, eat, we ate the fruit when it was ripe to put on, to store body fat for the winter. And we don't hibernate like some mammals, but we do go through a period where a food scarcity every year in the winter in all the the temperate zones. And that's that's a large percentage of where we live on the planet is the temperate zones. And so we learned how to use that fructose and that sugar to put on some weight so that if the winter was really sparse, we wouldn't starve to death. Now, other people, when they eat plants, they start to have their skin condition flares up or their joint condition flares up, or their gut condition flares up, or they notice a deterioration in their mental health. I don't have those. I'm just I'm just the fat white guy. I'm the guy that, that, that if I eat too many carbs, I'm going to get fat. And it'll no longer be this button in, in danger of popping. It'll be the one down over my belly button, which that's how it was back when I was weighed 297 pounds. And my wife bought me this shirt. I apologize for this. She likes them to be tight. I don't, not so much, but... Uh, but yeah, and so I think it's super important to to try these trials. I don't want you to blindly believe me ever. If you do a 90-day carnivore diet, beef, butter, bacon, eggs, or w- include seafood, include whatever, after those 90 days, I want you to experiment with carbs because this is the one science experiment that you have control over. And it's also the one that that you're going to either profit from or suffer from if you get it wrong. And so I think it's never a sin to say, okay, you know, I've heard of this guy. He says that his carnivore diet, he he eats lots of fruit and honey. Well, after you've been strict carnivore for 90 days, I want you to try that because it may be that as long as you keep your total carbs under a hundred a day, you can eat fruit and honey every day, maybe, but you need to try it and see. And, and so many people, when they try that, they're like, oh yeah, I can do this. It works good for me. Other people are like, oh, hell no. I started to gain weight immediately when I started to eat that fruit every day. I don't want to be fat anymore. I've, I've already been fat for 30 years. Jesse, I don't want to be fat no more. And so I'm just going to stick to strict carnivore. But those kind of experiments, I think, are very valuable for people to do. And uh, it kind of mimics how we lived in the past. Again, once again. If somebody wants to experiment and go all the way to the end of the spectrum and do strict carnivore for a period of time, at least, what does that look like? I know salt is obviously part of that, salting our food like we talked about before to taste. Meats, you mentioned butter, and um, you mentioned all the different types of animal fat that you consume. Let's talk about what falls under that strict carnivore umbrella. Yeah, so strict carnivore is anything that comes from an animal. And so depending on where you are in the world, that could be, that could be lizard. 
I also, let me add, I think that insects are carnivore. Humans have eaten insects for millions of years. I'm, I don't advocate that. I don't think that you should be forced to eat the bugs, but I, but we've all, we've always eaten insects and, and whether you want to eat them or not, I think is your decision and your choice, but that, that is a carnivore option. Uh, I like to talk about beef, butter, bacon, and eggs because it's very easy to remember. It's very affordable if you calculate how much it's costing you per pound of food. Uh, it's hard to forget. There, then that also obviates all the questions of, well, is this carnivore? If it ain't beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, don't it? Don't eat it, right? And then some people do uh, B, 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 and E and S, which is seafood. So sardines and, and mackerel and anchovies, the smaller cold water fish that don't eat enough other fish to accumulate the mercury. I think that's also very viable for people to do and also very affordable. And so basically, if it, if it, if it comes out of an animal's cloaca or it comes off an animal's body or it comes out of a, an animal's teat, then I think it is carnivore. Now we have to talk about milk. Because a lot of people will say, well, milk is carnivore. Yes, it is. But we have to go back and say, why do mammals give their babies milk? It's so they can grow and gain weight as quickly as possible. That's what milk is for. And it's perfectly designed to help you grow and gain weight. And so if you're finished growing, all milk's going to help you do is grow, right? Grow the, the, the direction you don't want to. And so this applies even to raw milk. I'm a big fan of raw milk. If you're going to drink milk, try to find a, a reliable source of raw milk. I think it is much less bad for adults to drink. Now, if you're a human being from zero days of age up to five or six or seven years of age, I think you'll benefit greatly from drinking goat's milk, maybe even cow's milk, but definitely goat's milk and sheep's milk. Camel milk is also a great source depending on where you live in the world. You're going to benefit from that because you're still growing. But the vast majority of humans, over three quarters of human beings alive on the planet right now, do not have lactase persistence. At about five, six, seven years of age, they lose their ability to break down lactose. I'm not talking about, oh, a few people in some weird country. I'm talking about 75% of the adult population on the planet is lactose intolerant. And we talk about that like it's a disease, we'll have lactose intolerance. That's the normal state. At three different times in evolution, have human beings adapted to probably what was a starvation situation. And they adapted and developed lactase persistence, which is, that's the enzyme that breaks down lactose. That's happened three different times, twice in Africa and once in the, the Nordic Scandinavian area. So we know we have a, an ability to do that, but the vast majority of us do not have lactase persistence. And so milk as an adult, even raw milk, is full of lactase, and that's going to lead to inflammation. That's going to lead to, to weight gain. And so if you're under the age of five, six, or seven, yes, drink your milk. Absolutely. But if you're above that age, unless you're wanting to grow and gain weight as quickly as possible, and uh, more than likely develop some degree of inflammation, I would highly encourage you to avoid milk. There's a new study just out in the nutrition literature that people with eosinophilic esophagitis, it, it gets drastically better when they just stop all dairy. And so the reason beef, butter, bacon, and eggs contains butter is because that's just the fat component of the dairy, right? You take away the lactose and the other sugars and you take away the proteins of the milk. You're left with just the fat component of the milk. And for some people, they're so sensitive to the dairy proteins that they have to actually clarify the butter and just only use ghee, right? But the vast majority of people can eat butter and there's not enough of the dairy protein, the caseins in the way to cause inflammation. And so beef, butter, bacon, and eggs is a great place for people to start because they can remember that the food's relatively cheap. And one of the beautiful things about a, a carnivore diet is you get to eat until you're comfortably stuffed. You don't have to portion control. You don't have to cal cal <clears throat> You don't have to calorie restrict. <clears throat> you get to eat until you're comfortably stuffed. Again, mimicking how our ancestors live forever and how every other wild mammal on the planet lives. They eat until they're full, then they stop eating. And for some people, when I say that, that sounds almost like a revolutionary statement, Jesse. But don't we all breathe when we need to breathe? And if we don't need to breathe, we don't breathe as much? Yeah. 
our heart beats as much as we need it to be. And if it's beating too fast, it slows down. If it's not beating fast enough, it speeds up. We don't have to think about that consciously. And it's my opinion that if you're eating on the proper human diet spectrum for you, you don't have to portion control. You don't have to count calories and restrict. You don't have to semi-starve yourself to maintain good health. Just like every other mammalian creature on the planet, if you're eating a species-specific diet, you get to eat until you're full. And then you don't eat again until you're hungry. And so also, this cuts out all the mindless snacking, the social eating. If you're not hungry, you don't eat. <clears throat> that's that's physiologically true to what we are. And so I think that is freeing for so many people because they've literally been portion controlling and calorie restricting for decades only to meet with failure, right? But they're still doing that. And so when they come to real whole food keto or keto or carnivore, they still want to, they feel like that's required. Oh, I have to, I can only eat just this much and so many ounces. No, no, no. You get to trust your hunger again. And for some people, that's terrifying, Jesse. For the first few weeks, they're like, no, you don't You don't know me. You think I can't binge on beef, butter, bacon, and eggs? Watch me. And I've actually had YouTube channels take me up on that because I offer, I offer one YouTube channel a thousand bucks. It's a husband and wife team, the two crazy ketos. I said, I'll give you a thousand bucks if you eat nothing but beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, and you can gain weight. And they're like, challenge accepted. And I didn't make a bet with them because I didn't want their thousand bucks. I just I just offered that reward. And after a month of gorging on beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, they both lost more weight even than they had lost on keto. And so I think the reason that kind of thing works is because we've gone we're going back to honoring the physiology of what this organism is. Inherently, if you're eating enough protein and enough fat you're going to put your satiety hormones in a position where only if you're at the, the county carnival's hot dog eating contest trying to win a hundred bucks, are you going to be able to overeat meat, fat, and protein? It's very, very hard to do. And you might do it for a week or two, but you're just going to naturally stop that inappropriate behavior when, you're, when your choices are beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. You can eat as much as you want, but that's your four choices. And for many people, that simplifies it to the point. And it also frees them like, oh, I'm not going to gain 50 pounds if I eat as much as I want in a month because or 90 days because Dr. Barry promised me that wouldn't happen. And for most, the vast majority of people at the end of that 90 day experiment, they're very thankful and very grateful to now know that about their physiology. You can trust your body if you're feeding it the right food. You can trust it not to betray you and not to go up four pant sizes in 90 days if you're not starving yourself. And I think that's very powerful. And for many people, that's when they, they realize, oh, this is not a diet. This is literally, I get to eat this way for the rest of my life. I get to eat until I'm comfortably stuffed because I haven't done that since, in many cases, since I was a teenager, I had to starve myself or I would get as big as a house. I don't have to do that anymore. How freeing is that for millions of people around the world? So you have the simplifying aspect of eating till you're full. I'd also assume it would be a lot simpler when it comes to, well, it is inevitably when you go grocery shopping, when it comes to what am I going to have for dinner tonight? I would assume, you know, you're going to have less recipes. You probably find your handful of recipes that you're going to use on a regular basis because you have less ingredients. So I can see how life in a general sense, you'd save a lot of mental bandwidth and it would just simplify things in a big way. Absolutely. And it winds up for many people being cheaper, especially people who were taking a handful of supplements every day and who were trying to buy all the this this protein bar and this protein shake and this and that. Because like I said earlier, when you do the math on those, they wind up to be 20 or 30 or $40 a pound. And would you rather spend 30 or $40 a pound for protein bars and protein shakes? Or would you rather just get your protein from $4 a pound eggs and, and even $10 a pound beef? It becomes very self-explanatory. And I think you're exactly right. You save all that mental bandwidth because another thing that, that ceases to have meaning is all the advertisements. The advertisements typically just literally become background noise. You could care less what Kellogg's has come out with the, the new whatever. You could care less. 
because you now realize that's not food. That's a product they're trying to sell me. They just want my five bucks. Uh, when the new protein bar, the new liver cleanse or the new whatever, fill in the blank, because everybody's trying to make a book. This is human nature. That doesn't mean we're evil. We're just all trying to get by and make a living. But you realize as an individual, I don't need any of that shit. Literally, none of it. I don't need any of that. And for some people, that saves them hundreds of dollars a month. When they realize with the, just a few simple supplements, only needed because of our mismanagement of, of, of herds and of soil for the last 200 years. If it weren't for that mismanagement, we wouldn't even need the supplements. But currently we do. And, but there's only a very short list of inexpensive supplements that you need if you're eating a proper human diet. That includes lots of fatty meat and hopefully some sort of liver once or twice a week. You don't need any of that, those supplements. You don't need any of those protein bars, collagen, branched chain amino acid, creatine. I mean, literally, I could go on for five minutes listing all the crap that is now a waste of money for you. And for many people to find that I'm saving tons of mental bandwidth. I don't have to think about this shit anymore. I just do it. And I'm sa I'm actually saving money on my gross my my monthly grocery and supplement bill. I don't have to buy all that stuff anymore. I literally go to one or two sections in the grocery. I'm done. I'm in and out of the grocery store in literally 10 minutes if checkout's fast enough. I'm back home. I've got my food for the week. I don't have any temptations in the in the fridge, the freezer or the pantry. I've I, I can meal prep if I want to. I'm not a meal prepper, Jesse. I don't know about you, but my meal prep is go look in the fridge, grab some meat, put it in the skillet for three minutes on each side, eat the meat. That's my meal prep. And that's that's how I live every day. Or I'll go get a dozen eggs, crack them open, and lightly cook them just till the white's done and eat, eat that uh, the whole dozen. That's my meal prep. And I don't like to meal prep, but if somebody wants to meal prep, you can go crazy prepping your meat and getting it ready in individual servings if that's your style, but that's not my style. Let's make sure we clarify what that short list of supplements that you're into are. I know you mentioned salt before, and that could be looked at as sort of a supplement to what you're consuming on a regular basis right. and electrolytes. But what right. other ones do we have in there? So salt should not be a supplement. It should be in our food, but it's currently not because we think eating blood and, and stuff like that is gross. So it's it, we have to treat it as a supplement. The electrolytes and the minerals we have to treat as a supplement because the, the soil has been so mismanaged for the last two centuries that in either the minerals are not in the soil or they are in the soil, but the soil has been so improperly managed that the, the minerals are locked up deep in the soil and we can't get access to them. So if the, if the plant that grew in the soil, if it doesn't contain the mineral, then I don't care what the USDA Food Data Central website says. That mineral is not in that broccoli. That mineral is not in that strawberry if it's not in the soil. It has to be in the soil and it has to be available. Same goes for meat. If the soil that the pig, the chicken, the cow grazed on, if that soil doesn't contain that mineral, then it's not in the beef. It's not in the chicken. It's not in the egg. Regardless of what the USDA says, it's in an egg. It can't be in there. It's impossible, right? And so salt, electrolytes, minerals, and then for many people who live in the interior of large continents, there's not enough iodine in the soil. And many people are deficient in iodine and they have no idea. They have symptoms of low thyroid, fatigue, can't lose weight, etc. And they're really quite iodine deficient. Uh, checking your serum iodine level will not reveal this because your body uses iodine for so many things that it keeps your serum level very tightly controlled. People think, oh, it's just about your thyroid gland, iodine. The people who are a little smarter think, oh, no, it's about your thyroid and your mammary glands. People who are a little smarter say, oh, no, it's also your salivary glands. And then people who have watched my YouTube video about just how important iodine is know that every cell in your body, without exception that's ever been studied, has a sodium iodide symptom on the cell membrane. What that means is, is that your cell is expending energy to pull iodine inside the cell. That's, that's not trivial. Cells don't waste energy to pull, th pull whatever inside the cell unless it needs that thing. And so, and then vitamin D for many of us that live at far northern or far southern latitudes, we just don't get enough vitamin D because the sun should be the place where you get the majority. You can also get vitamin D 
from your diet. I've got a YouTube video, the seven top vitamin D rich foods, and you can get it from there. But for many of us, we can't get enough. And so for some of us, at least during parts of the year, we need to supplement with vitamin D. And that's literally it. If you're including egg yolks in your diet, you're going to get plenty of folate. Uh, there are some strict carnivores who only eat ruminant meats called a lion diet. And a few of those guys have developed a folate deficiency. Not, not, it wasn't dangerous. They just, their level dipped below normal. But if you include egg yolks in your proper human diet, you're going to get plenty of folate, plenty of choline. And so that you understand what a short list of supplements that is. And, and it, three of the things, the salt, the electrolytes, and the minerals, you'll only have to take those until such time as you spurred the local rancher and local farmer economy until you, you're surrounded by local ranchers and local gardeners again, then you won't, you won't need these at all. Which is great. I'd be I'd be very happy to never ever have another bottle sold because I'm not here trying to sell supplements. I'm here trying to help people improve their health. When you went over your food prep there, I got a bit of an idea of what you'd be eating in a typical day. But let's get into the nuances there of when you're eating and what you'd eat in a typical day, given your diet is so unique compared to what the average person is eating. So I'm six feet three inches tall. And currently weigh about 230 pounds. That's where my metabolic set point currently is. That may change for the better or the worse, but I'm very happy uh, because I used to weigh 297 pounds. And so I'm very happy with 230. I tend to hold more muscle. I'm very active on the farm. And so a great percentage of that body weight is strong bones and lots of muscle. So I'm very happy at 230. I feel great. My clothes fit except the shirt Nisha bought me. It's a little tight in the chest. Uh, but so my typical diet, I just wanted to give that so people would go, okay, well, I'm, you know, five foot one woman and I weigh 110 pounds. What's my diet going to look like compared to his? And so typically on a typical day, I'll eat probably two pounds of beef, uh, probably the, the yolks from eight eggs and the whites from four of those eggs. Uh, I do better with a higher fat. And I'll put butter on the eggs and I'll put butter on the, the beef as well. I salt liberally. I put a few drops of the mineral drops just because out of an abundance of caution, because I don't know if that cow grazed on soil that had selenium and had strontium and had molybdenum and had iodine. I don't know if it had if, it, if that soil had that. I don't know where that cow came from because I bought it at Walmart or Kroger. Right. And so out of an abundance of caution, I always add those things just to make sure I'm getting enough, because if I get a little too much, I'm just going to urinate that away. So probably two pounds of beef. Sometimes I'll eat chicken, sometimes pork, but I tend to feel best when I'm eating beef and, and egg yolks. That's that feels like where I'm the best. Two or three times a week, I'll eat a couple of cans of sardines with the bones in and the skin on. And I usually put zero carb mustard on my sardines because I don't love sardines. But with a little bit of zero carb mustard, I love them at that point, and I can eat them. About one one day a week, I'll eat a, can, a tin of cod liver or some type of liver. I'll eat chicken liver. I'll eat sheep's liver, venison liver, tur wild turkey liver, because we, we're surrounded by hunters, and they all know to bring me the heart and liver. And so I've always got a freezer full of, of turkey heart and liver, venison heart and liver, and at least once or twice or thrice a week, I'll try to eat some liver. Because that's that is the ultimate superfood. That's inarguable. Anybody who's looked up the nutrition density of liver, any liver, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be beef liver. It can be any liver. It, it blows away superfoods like blueberries and kale and ossi and all the other bullshit that people talk about. If you want true nutrient density, eat two ounces of liver twice a week. It will it will obviate so many supplements. And so I like chicken liver. I like cod liver. I can eat beef liver, but I don't love it. I can eat pork liver, but I don't love it. And so I just stick with the liver I love. And I'm also always looking for liver recipes because I would love to love beef liver. But I, as of yet, I can't love it. It, it. it tastes too livery to me. But that that's literally my diet. Rarely I'll have some veg off my wife, Nisha's plate. So she's a ketovore. So she keeps her total carbs under 10 total grams a day. And so sometimes if, if she's got some delectable looking uh, roasted Brussels sprouts, I'll have I'll have one. 
but that's rare. I don't, I don't make a daily practice of that because even for me, that's too many carbohydrates if I did that on a daily basis. Uh, what else? I, I drink water. I do drink uh, caffeine-free coffee. I've been off caffeine for a couple of months just to see. I'm doing that, that N equals one, the most important experiment to me. Does caffeine affect me negatively or not? And I got a lot of, of feedback from the carnivore community saying, dude, you need to quit caffeine because I promise you, you'll feel better. So I'm off caffeine for a month and a half now. And in the future, I'm going to do a couple of months with no coffee whatsoever, just to see if I feel better or not. I feel no different with decaf versus caffeinated. And I know it's not hundred percent caffeine free. I know that. Uh, but when I'm doing no coffee for a month or two, I'll see. If, if that's, if, is that beneficial to me or not? If it is, I'll continue it. If it's not beneficial or not beneficial enough, then I'll go back to drinking my regular coffee. But I think anytime you hear something like that, you should be like, huh, I wonder if I should try that. Nothing's going to kill you if you try it for a month. So your weight loss journey, you started at 297. You mentioned you're down to 230 where you feel good right now. How long was that journey to get down? What would that be? 37 pounds or 37 pounds. That would be what? 67 pounds. Yeah. yeah. 67 pounds. It probably took me three years. And what was the dietary progress? Talk about when you really noticed things kick in and the weight started coming off. So the first few years of my medical practice, I basically lived in scrubs. Okay. I, I was a full-time emergency department physician working in the ER. And then I also started a clinic, which I thought was going to be a side gig, but quickly turned into another full-time job. And so I lived in scrubs because it was cool. You know, I looked like Grey's Anatomy, but also I didn't have time and I didn't have the inclination to develop a wardrobe. So I just lived in scrubs. They have a drawstring on the waist. And so you can literally gain 10 inches on your waistline and your scrubs will still fit. Right. And so it's very misleading. You're like, no, my scrubs still fit. It's fine. But one day I got on the scale and I hadn't been on the scale. I, never, I just never did that. And I was 290 pounds. I'm like, holy shit, that's not good. I did. I knew I'd gain some weight, but come on. And I thought, well, I better get all my labs checked. And sure enough, I was pre-diabetic. I had an A1C of 6.1. And at that point, I didn't even know enough to check my, my fasting insulin or any of these other markers that we now know sometimes can help people. And so I thought, well, I got it. I'm pre-diabetic. I better follow the ADA diet. And so I printed out their handout that I was giving to patients and I started following that and I started jogging. And I did that for 90, um, 180 days and got back on the scale and I'd actually gained five or six more pounds. And my A1C had went up a little bit more. And I was, that was the epiphany for me. Like, okay, so I don't, I, honestly don't know a damn thing about how to feed a human. Keep in mind, I've been daily giving nutrition advice to every single one of my patients. Do you find that worrisome? I do. Yeah. And so really the reason I do social media now is to make up for my past indiscretions and my past sins and failings where I actually harm people with the nutrition advice I was giving them, which consisted mainly of join the gym and join Weight Watchers. That's what you need to do. Stop being a glutton and a sloth. And so, yeah, uh, so I, 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 after three or six months of the ADA diet that made me more metabolically sick, I thought, well, there's, I don't know. I don't even know where to start. And so I read a book by Mark Sisson, the primal blueprint. And I read a book by Lauren Cordain, the paleo diet. And I found a, a, a copy of Dr. Atkins diet revolution for 50 cents at a rummage sale. Those are my three first books I read. And I was like, okay, so low carb, Nutrient dense. Okay. All right. I kind of see how that, you know, sugar, carbs turn into sugar. Okay. All right. So I started doing then low carb primal paleo, but it wasn't low carb enough. And my health improved a little, but not much. Uh, inflammation definitely didn't improve many because on my paleo, I was eating lots of quinoa and lots of sweet potatoes, right? And lots of, lots of beans. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And then I kept hearing about keto and I read up on that a little bit. I'm like, no, that makes even more sense because it's really, it's lower in carbohydrates. Not just am I eating natural carbohydrates, which, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But I'm eating low carbohydrate. Maybe that's the key. And when I started keto, real whole food keto with lots of fatty meat and eggs, I started to lose weight like gangbusters. And when I say lose weight, I mean metabolize fat. I wasn't losing muscle. I was actually was putting on muscle. The more I, meat I ate, I was actually just naturally carrying more muscle 
which I found weird. I thought you had to work out to gain muscle. And I still think you do have to work out to carry lots of muscle. If you want to look like the cover of Muscle and Fitness, you got to work out. But to just effortlessly carry more muscle and have stronger bones, it's it's literally your diet. And so I reversed the pre-diabetes completely with keto. Lost probably down to 260, 250. And then I kept hearing about Sean Baker in this carnivore diet. And I thought, well, you know, if you think about it, rationally, a carnivore diet is just keto, but with the carbohydrate intake turned down to zero. I think I'm going to try this. So I, I did a challenge on my Facebook page. I was like, hey, let's do carnivore for 30 days. Now, I had other medical conditions as well. One of the things I suffered from was severe reflux, ungodly reflux. I used to take two Nexium every day. When the drug rep brought Nexium samples, the patients didn't get those samples. I took them all because my it was awful. It affected my speech. It affected how I slept at night. It was terrible. On keto, that got 80% better. Now I could just take a Tums occasionally, once a day or every other day, and my heartburn was under control. I didn't have to take the Nexium, which then subsequently, I, with some research, I found out all the terrible things that taking a daily Nexium or Prevacid or Prilosec do to your body. They're very, very unhealthy, but most people don't know that, including most doctors. And so my heartburn was 80% better with keto, which, oh my God, if you've ever had severe heartburn, that's a big deal. But after that month of carnivore, I'd lost another five pounds, but I had zero heartburn, Jesse. And that was miraculous to not have to worry about where the Nexium was. Where's the apple cider vinegar? Where's the Tums? I didn't, I didn't have to worry about that. And, and it, I didn't realize it the first few weeks of carnivore, but on that last day, I'm like, holy shit. I haven't had any reflux for a month. This is awesome. I'm going to do this for another month. And the weight loss just kept going. And so I had I had stalls and sticks just like everybody else. I stuck at 260 for quite a while. Then I stuck at 250. Then I stuck at 240. And now I'm stuck at 230. Is this my optimal weight or should I be 210? I think that's debatable at this point with my visceral body fat percentage being what it currently is, which is within well within normal range. Would I be healthier at 110? I'd probably look better, but I don't know if I'd be healthier or not. I think at some point it, it, there's a range of healthy body fat and there's a range of body weight that's healthy for people. I don't think there's one specific number, uh, but I've, I've been carnivore ever since. And that's that's been four years now, four and a half years that, that there's literally. Uh, and so every now and then at Christmas anniversary, I'll go off a little bit, but I immediately feel it in my gut because I fatten very easily. I'll immediately feel my pants starting to talk to me. And also I'll, I'll, I'll start to have just a little echo of heartburn if I get too far off. Or I'll have a little echo of the severe knee arthritis that I used to have every single day, even in my mid-30s. That'll start to flare up. And I'm like, oh, okay, time to tighten it up. Because my goal is to, I, don't, I care what the scale says, but that's not my primary motivation. My primary motivation is being a good example to my, to my six kids and to my community, to my family and my patients to is, is being very motivated mentally, being very active physically. We have a 40 acre farm and I'm out there. As soon as we're done, I'm headed to the farm to work for multiple hours. And I want to be able to do that without having to take breaks, without having to be exhausted, without having to be in pain the next day. Those are kind of, those are my whys, you might say. Why are you doing this? That's why. I want to be kicking the soccer ball around with Beckett's grandkids. When I'm 107, I want to be that guy out there with all the family going, oh, Grandpa, sit down. You're going to hurt yourself. And I'm like, leave me alone. I'm playing with my great-grandkids. That's the guy I want to be. And I think this, this is the way of eating that's going to get me as close to that as is possible. And so it was on carnivore that I attained my, my lowest body fat percentage and my lowest weight on the scale. Zero heartburn. <clears throat> Joint pain non-existent. I used to have rosacea. That's gone. With carnivore, I used to have severe dandruff. I used to have severe toenail fungus. I used to, I mean, there's a long list. It, it was not pretty at all. Okay. I'm not sure how I landed Nisha Salisbury, but I did somehow, luckily. Thank God. Uh, but it was not a pretty picture. I was not a happy guy. I was not, I was not comfortable with how I looked in the mirror. I was not comfortable with my, the way my body was performing. And on that journey from 
high carb to low carb to keto to ketovore now to carnivore. That was my journey. And will I always have to stay a carnivore? I, I mean, I don't know. I, I love it. I'm happy to stay here. But it, would there come a time where, when I could go back and eat 50 total grams of carbs a day? Maybe. I don't know. We, we currently have no research, no testing for the epigenetic stuff. Uh, there are people out there who will try to sell you genetic testing and epigenetic testing. But currently, we do not know enough about that. There's not enough research for that to in any way be reliable. And so all we can do is just go by how we feel, how we're thinking, and how we look in the mirror. That's, that's, typically, that's, that's literally the state of the art that you've got to go on right now as, as far as what foods you should eat and what food-like products you should avoid. So you've narrowed your diet down to carnivore, and you mentioned four or five years you've been on this diet. What is it like when you sit down to a meal having only that narrow range of foods you're eating? Do you still get excited about food or has it just become fuel at this point? Talk about how you feel because, again, you've been doing this a while now and having a lot of the same foods. So uh, very many people are mortified when you say all, all you're going to eat for the next 90 days is beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. They're like, I'll be bored to death. I will, that's, I, there's no way. I need variety. <clears throat> well, for many people, that's, that's the addiction talking. Because if you eat a large enough variety, there's going to be some sugar and carbs in there, right? For other people, they think that. But I have yet to sit down to a plate full of perfectly cooked ribeye and eggs and say, darn it, I'm so sick of ribeye and eggs. That's yet to happen. And so I think a lot of people are pleasantly surprised that when they're eating nutrient-dense, ancestrally appropriate food that's uninflammatory, their body quickly falls in love with that food. And it's never the addiction fall in love with, like when you used to be craving that huge bowl of cocoa puffs and chocolate milk every night as you watch Netflix. It's not that kind of pleasure. It's a different kind of pleasure. It's a more instinctual pleasure, a more biological pleasure. But I'm I'm never disappointed when I sit down to a plate of meat and eggs. That's number one. Number two is don't you miss all that other stuff. And initially when I was going low carb and primal and paleo and keto, I would miss it and I would go back. But that was the that was the addiction talking. Now, as my body has come to realize, oh man, we're about to sit down to pure nutrition. Yes. And re remembering what happens when I eat that inflammatory junk? I don't miss it at all. And it's not even that I, I'm, I'm, I don't eat it now because I don't want that flare up of rosacea or that flare up of GERD. That's not even the motivation. Now, I don't even consider this food anymore. This is not food. And I think when people have that shift in their paradigm, that makes them bulletproof at that point. You can't trick them if you come out with a new granola bar or a new cereal or a new protein, this, that, or the other, they're just, they're just like, no, no, that's not real food. I eat real food because I want real health. So I eat real food. And I think for many people, that's almost the, the armor. After you've done this for a while and you've strayed a few times and you've, you've reaped the inf inflammatory uh, harvest of straying from your diet, you're like, oh, that sucked. Okay, let's not do that anymore. So you get that negative feedback, and then you're getting the positive feedback from eating this nutrient-dense food. But at some point, you just realize it's like an epiphany. You're like, this that shit's not even food. I, I You know, my grandmother called it food, and my mother called it food. And people don't realize it takes two generations to form a habit in a culture. If If your grandmother taught you something and your mom reinforced it, that's it. That is that in your in your animal mind, that's law. That is that is a law of nature. And so if, if you grew up with your mom and your grandmother giving you this, you think this is food. You're deluded. And they they loved you and they still do. They didn't mean to, to mislead you, but they were misled. And so they passed on this misleading tradition down to you with the with nothing but love in their heart. But yet you're the one suffering. So it's not your fault, but it is your problem. That's the bad news. The good news is, is you can fix this by realizing, okay, let me think again with fresh brain. Let me look with fresh eyes. What should human beings eat on a daily basis? And what should they never eat on a daily basis if the goal is optimizing my physical and mental health? 
And so now if you, you can make me the most scrumptious hot fudge Sunday cake, whatever, I, it's literally not tempting at all. But there was a period of time and during the transition where I'd have been like, mm, you know, one bite's not going to hurt anything. And then that <clears throat> one bite turned into two servings. But now I'm, I'm not even tempted by that. And I think most people find that when they've been PhD long enough, strict enough, it just loses its magic. And I think that's a large part of it. We, we learn superstition from our friends and family, right? If you just think about us as a, as a, as an organism, we learn black cat crossing the road. We learn we, that stuff's not inherent. That's not intuitive. We're taught that. And then we pass that on to our ancestors. But obviously a black cat crossing your path is meaningless. It means nothing. But we're taught that. And so we make the sign of the X and all the other superstitions that we do because our grandmother and our mother, our grandfather, our uncle, people that, that we evolutionarily listen to with, without filters, whatever they say is, is that's, that's the law of nature because that's how we're programmed to think as children. So many things that, that you were taught are incorrect. And that's okay as long as you realize that and you reexamine everything you were taught about nutrition and in many cases about living a proper human life. You gotta you gotta revisit all that stuff with a fresh brain and fresh eyes and go, is that really true? Or is that not true? And that continues to happen to me, Jesse, even to this day. And I literally, this is my life. I study nutrition and medicine and anthropology and paleoanthropology. That's literally ask my wife. She'll be like, Yeah, I'm tired of hearing it. I want to hear it. But I still discover things like, oh, holy crap, I've never thought of it that way before. Huh. Okay, got it. And so don't feel like, oh, I'm I'm an idiot. I'm dumb. I don't know any of this stuff. Every time you learn and every time you unlearn one of these superstitions that you were taught, you're you're one step closer to your goal of physical health and mental health. You're one step closer to achieving the waistline and the A1C and all the other markers. You're one step closer. And so as you unlearn just as quickly, and it goes hand in hand with learning, you're also unlearning. Ultimately, you're going to have unlearned enough bullshit and learned enough true nutrition fact for human beings. There's good health. There it is right in front of you. And at that point, it'll seem self-evident like, well, duh, but you've got to unlearn a lot of false beliefs that you've been taught. In many cases, by Kellogg's and General Mills and Kraft, Heinz and Mondelez and Coca-Cola and Pepsi. They've taught you tons of things as you were growing up through television and magazine commercials. But you, you, in your subconscious, you think that's fact. But it's not fact. And you've got to unlearn all those things. And so for many people, this is almost a journey of self-discovery or rediscovering who they really are and what they really are. And some people hate that journey and they fight every step of it, but other, others love that journey, like discovering who I really am and what I really need and what I can do without and what's bullshit. My, many people love that journey. And I'm one of those people. I love that journey. Every day I, when I, when I discover I was wrong about something, that's a huge happy moment for me because not only now do I get to be even more healthy, but I get to help a million people I can, they don't have to keep making that same mistake for five more years until they discover it. I can make a YouTube video and they're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. That makes good sense. I'm going to try that. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. I know that you've tried. I know that you've, you've really put in the effort, but you were given the wrong information. If you want good health and, until being very, very, very old, you need to eat this way.